students, faculty, parents, families, honored guests. Welcome to the commencement ceremony for the class of 2022 at Providence Classical Christian Academy. Today, we are overjoyed to recognize the achievements of the seniors graduating this year and invite you to join us in this day of celebration. It is with great joy that the faculty and families look back on the years of study that you have spent here at Providence. But at Providence, we celebrate not only the academic accomplishments of these students, but the many ways in which the Lord uses all of the experiences of your years as a student to shape you into the fine adults that you have become today. It's our prayer that the Lord will continue to work in and through you for the glory of his kingdom and for the good of the world. Please join, we, join me as we open in a brief word of prayer as we ask for the Lord's blessing upon our activities this evening. Let's pray. Our gracious heavenly Father, be most glorified this day as we reflect the exalted Christ, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. We will begin tonight's commencement by hearing from our seniors. It's my honor to welcome them to the podium as each in their own way has exemplified wisdom, virtue, and eloquence to God's glory, which is what we strive to equip all of our students with. They've taken up roles of student leadership in and for the school over the years. They have become dear friends to the faculty, and we will miss all that they add to our community here at Providence as they graduate and pursue uh, future pursuits. I now call forward first our salutatorian, Zeke Sparks, to be followed by our valedictorian, Becca Marcotte, to present their addresses. Well, as the salutatorian for this year's senior class, it is my joy and honor to again welcome you to tonight's graduation of the senior class of 2022. I would like to first begin by saying thank you to the people who made this all possible. I want to thank the teachers who spent an abundance of effort, time, and care for their students and contributed many more years devoting themselves to our education and teaching us not only what, but how to live with wisdom, virtue, and eloquence. I want to thank my parents for sending me to Providence and investing tirelessly their own time, money, and resources so that I might enter into life with wisdom and confidence in every area of my life. I finally thank my peers and fellow students for the true friendship and kindness that they display every day, making Providence a place that I can think back on and smile at the good memories. And because of them, I know that I will always be welcome at Providence. Many times over the course of my high school career, I, find it, I found myself pondering the question of, where would I be if I had not gone to Providence? What would I be doing? Who would I be? What kind of friends would I have? I feel that I have made a miscalculation in dwelling on these questions because it means I'm focusing on what I do not have, what Providence failed to do for me. At times, at times, this has led me to feel frustration about where God has placed me, imagining in vain how much better I would be if I had just gone to a different school. I still ask myself those questions, and it is not a bad thing that I do that. I think that is quite natural to wonder and measure out your own potential, but dwelling on them came at a cost, namely my investment in life at Providence. So lately, I've been asking the questions, who have I become? How has Providence made me who I am? What am I doing, and is it good? I will admit that my high school experience had its ups and downs, but I think that its flaws were what made it memorable. At the end of my freshman year in 2019, my class size went from nine people to four. I still remember entering into my sophomore and junior years, wondering why I was still here. But now that I'm graduating, I see that those years were the most important years of my high school career were the things that truly pushed me to explore who I was and what I was doing. I could have only had that experience as early as I did if I had stayed at Providence. So as my senior year progressed, I grew in my love for Providence because I recognized the weaknesses of attending a small school, and I saw how those obstacles could be overcome and transformed into something beautiful. I became willing to buy into Providence, and as I grew in relationship with my teachers, I saw how they genuinely cared for each student. 
I think that because of my small class and tough high school career, I can truly say that the relationships that I have made here are one of the most important and dear things to me at Providence. As I think back through my school career, it amazes me that so much can change in so little time. The friends, the class dynamics, teachers, size of class, and even myself. I remember still being a child and wanting so much to become a grown up and get a job so that I could have unlimited fun. <laughs> and now that that's finally here, in one sense I'm not ready. I want just one more year of school, one more year to be a kid. It truly is bizarre to be standing on the stage right now on the cusp of entering real life. But in another sense, I feel ready. I feel ready for life's struggles, life's up and ups and downs, and ready for what comes next. So thank you teachers, classmates, friends, parents, for making my school career so memorable. Thank you for the friendships. Thank you for teaching me how to love the, the ups and downs. And thank you for the wisdom, virtue, and eloquence that I get to carry with me as I enter into adulthood. Thank you. While preparing for graduation day, I knew that I would need to prepare a speech, but as with most assignments this year, I procrastinated writing it until the last second. When I sat down to write this speech, I had a conversation with my sister about what progress I had made on it. During our conversation, she encouraged me to write less about what I think people want to hear and more what I want to say to all of you for the last time. So classmates, teachers, friends, family, and the Providence community, I would like to express my thanks say goodbye, and offer encouragement to everyone who has been a part of my life here at Providence. I first want to thank everyone who has given their time, energy, and devotion to Zeke and I throughout our time here. Miss Temi, even though you had us first hour every day, thank you for being patient with our slow, tired brains. Thank you for always being interested in hearing about our weekends and listening to us rant about how busy we are. Your excitement in class has always been a pleasant start to the day, and I think it is important you know that you redeemed the use of PowerPoint presentation for me. <laughs> Mr. Duvier, thank you for staying so devoted to our class for the, from the time we were rambunctious seventh graders in seventh hour during Latin class to talking to us about Paradise Lost over Zoom during COVID. Mrs. Bliss, thank you for letting me crash your pre-calculus class and always being so interested in my life outside of Providence. Your friendship has meant so much to me. Mrs. Rolowski, Thank you for your devotion you gave to our class in teaching us algebra, chemistry, and physics. How you managed to teach us physics every day last hour, I'll never understand. <laughs> Ms. Brewer, I am very grateful for the dedication and encouragement you gave me in my writing because you managed to get a girl who never liked writing and always dreaded rhetoric class to finish a 20-page research project and even enjoy some of the process along the way. Mr. Buckles, Thank you for teaching us in our earlier years in literature and composition and the encouragement you gave me as an actor in the school plays. Mr. Keating, thank you for teaching and challenging us in theology and history over the years. I especially want to thank you for being my mentor here at Providence. You were always a listening ear when my class experienced conflict and were willingly involved in, being in my well-being not only as a student but in every aspect of my life. Zeke. Thank you for putting up with the days where I was wildly energetic and the days I could have passed for a dead man walking. I truly value the friendship we have built and strengthened over this year, and I pray the Lord guides your path wherever you are in life. And lastly, Mom and Dad, thank you for being my biggest supporters, not only in school, but also in dance. Thank you for the love you have shown me and for the encouragement you never failed to give me. You helped me make the most of my time here at Providence and have guided and loved me through it all. Though I have formally attended Providence from kindergarten through 12th grade, I have actually been a part of this community far longer. I remember coming to school with my mom to pick up my older siblings from school, joining them on class field trips, and getting to come every, once every week to sit with the big kids at lunch during lunch duty. Since Providence has been a part of my, my whole life, it has played an important role in making me who I am today. And as I stand here before you, I can say with all sincerity that I am sad I have to say goodbye. While attending the school, there have been many unique things I have loved being a part of because of the experiences they have given me and the lessons they have taught me. 
Being a house captain and a member of student council taught me how to be an encouraging and determined leader. Taking part in school plays allowed me to grow in confidence and be slightly less afraid of public speaking. The challenging academics at Providence taught me, taught me the importance of a strong worth ethic and strengthened my critical thinking and writing skills. Finally, the relationships I created with teachers and fellow students have played an important role in shaping who I am today and have guided and challenged me to relate to others with constant care and love. This school and its community has, have been a valuable part of my life. As I receive my diploma here in a few moments, I find myself thankful yet saddened that I must say goodbye one last time to this beautiful building, this beautiful leaky building, and all of the loving people that have been a part of my life and childhood. Finally, I would like to offer encouragement to students who have more time left here at Providence. While attending the school, though there have been many experiences I have enjoyed, there have also been many challenges. Through these challenges, I have learned firsthand how the Lord works things for good in all situations. I think it's honest to say that our class has, its fair, has had its fair share of challenges, from starting with 19 in elementary school, then shrinking down to nine students at the start of high school, to ending up as a graduating class of two. Some of you may wonder if there is value in that. There were difficulties, there were tears, there were times I wanted to give up, times I wanted to quit because it seemed eas the easiest option and a way to escape the struggles that I had come through. However, one night I was, when I was struggling, someone reminded me that good or bad, there was a purpose to everything. Then I was able to sit and experience the realization that there was purpose to each and every good and each and every difficult thing I faced. During all of this, I am thankful to have been in school where people care for me on a personal level and where I was encouraged to put Christ first in all of the things in my life. Each one of us will face challenges alongside the, alongside the triumphs of our life. There will be difficulties, tears, and times we want to give up. Do not give up. Being still in the Lord and waiting, every, and waiting for everything to make sense is difficult. Looking back at my time at Providence, I am grateful that the Lord placed me here and blessed me with the people who have faithfully guided me because I have learned and grown in valuable ways. Students of Providence, Attending a small school that not many people have heard of is not easy, and each class and grade comes with its own challenges. But I want to encourage you not to give up. Take the challenges you face to the Lord. He is faithful. Strive to glorify God by persevering in the midst of trials, because the Lord will provide. He will provide you with wisdom and guidance to take on your challenges, and will place the people in your life who will love and support you. As I, choose, as I close my speech, I would like to end by reciting Psalm 145, verses 18 and 19. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. Thank you. Thank you both. At this time, I would like to invite our upper school choir to come to the stage as they sing Da Pacem Domine. The Latin text of their anthem translates to give us peace in our days.
Thank you, Upper School Choir. Now, we would like to welcome to the podium our keynote speaker for the class of 2022, Mr. Kyle Keating. Each year, we ask the senior class to choose their keynote speaker for the commencement ceremony, and this year, they have selected Mr. Keating, who has, of course, served as their teacher for a number of years and as dean for several of those years in the upper school as well. Mr. Keating has the special opportunity to teach our students both in history and in theology during their final year here at Providence. And especially in the theology class, they're able to work through and consider many important theological, cultural, and often uh, deeply personal questions and challenges that they perhaps are facing now or will face after graduation. As he's uniquely positioned to address these seniors, having had in-depth discussions and built significant relationships with each of them, we are delighted to have him share at this time. Please welcome Mr. Keating. Well, it is my great pleasure and delight uh, to speak at the commencement for the class of 2022. It's hard to believe that it's here. It feels like yesterday that we were going on senior walk at retreat, looking ahead to the year that was to come. Uh, but here we are. And uh, so uh, I'm hoping I will cry only a few times. Uh, I cried during practice, so I don't know how well that bodes, but <laughs> we'll see how it goes. So this evening, if you'll bear with me, I'm going to tell you two different stories. And I hope that in their telling, a common theme will emerge, a theme that will tell you something about the class of 2022 and my hope for them as they graduate. There is a story buried deep in the book of Isaiah about a king standing on a wall, staring out into inevitable defeat. His city is surrounded by a massive invading army, and his allies are few and far between. His other fortified cities have already been conquered, and it's only a matter of time before the walls of his own city fall. King Hezekiah stands, his mind perhaps filled with the knowledge of all the previous defeats, even as his eyes were filled with the, with the throngs of Assyrians camped outside the gates. It was at this moment that the Rabshakeh, the representative of Sennacherib, who was the king of Assyria, comes up to the walls and he speaks to Hezekiah's soldiers on those walls. Whom do you trust, he asks. Your ally, Egypt? She's a broken reed of a staff that will pierce any who lean upon it. Your army? If I gave you 2,000 horses, would you be able to find the men to ride them? Your God? Beware lest Hezekiah mislead you by saying the Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Give up. Surrender. It will be better than dying in defeat. Well, the Rabshakeh has a point. Egypt is a weak ally. Judah's armies are no match for Assyria's. The Lord... Well, everyone else's gods have fallen before the might of Sennacherib. Perhaps surrender is the most sensible option. A second story, another king. He stands across the field from another invading army, this time a Viking horde. They have crushed every Saxon kingdom on the Isle of Britain and are preparing to crush the last holdout, a small kingdom called Wessex, led by an oft sickly king named Alfred. His armies have been battered by the overwhelming might of the Viking Danes. He's forced into hiding on the run, left to meditate on the kingdom he's lost. In G.K. Chesterton's telling of his story in the epic poem, The Ballad of the White Horse, the Viking King Guthrum declares, Wherefore I am a great king and waste the world in vain, because man hath not other power, save that in dealing death for dower. He may forget it for an hour to remember it again. Guthrum has a point. He's conquered the world, and he's used his overwhelming power to deal death to every Saxon kingdom. Why should Alfred hope that his fate would be any different? These kings, Hezekiah and Alfred, they knew something that our seniors know too, and that perhaps many in this room know as well, that life is full of defeats. In fact, it is in some sense, as the author J.R.R. Tolkien put it, a long defeat. Tolkien references the long defeat in the Fellowship of the Ring, suggesting that even in the midst of victories, and graduating from high school is certainly a victory, there is the inevitability of coming defeat. 
that seems cynical to our ears, perhaps. But Tolkien was a realist about evil. He had seen it firsthand in the Great War, where he lost some of his closest friends. He knew that triumphs are brief and grief never far off. It is, of course, no secret that this class was once larger. Through many different trials and tribulations, and for reasons good and bad, students have trickled away until only two remain. To see your friends depart is a defeat. To be left as the only two remaining is a defeat. I don't know how many of you have had the experience of being in a class of two, but it is not easy. It isn't easy to wrestle with whether or why you should stay when everyone else has left. The long defeat is an apt theme for the class of 2022, not because of their failures, though like all of us, they have their own, but because they've been so battered by the winds of circumstance, the wounds of friends, encounters with loss, pain, and death, and the deep and abiding sense that things are not the way they are supposed to be. A lot of classes graduate not having grown so deeply familiar with this truth, but this class has. They know Tolkien was right, that it should not surprise us as Christians to encounter defeat, because defeat was set in motion by the fall in Genesis 3. And the reality is that even for those of us who follow God, defeat will not be a stranger. We see this on a grander scale than just the personal, too. We live in a cultural moment where Christian belief is not merely contested, but often held in contempt when the enemies seem many and the victories seem few and far between. Seniors, after you graduate and head off into your various vocations, you will see even more clearly how fraught the world is. The world's temptations are strong, her power formidable, her allies numerous. She will come at you with accusations. You can't really believe that your God is the only true God. If you believe that doctrine, then you must be a bigot. She will come at you with sly suggestions. Trust in yourself. You know what's best for you. You don't need anyone else to tell you the truth. She will come at you with alluring temptations. Money, success, power, these will bring you happiness. If you just make it to the next thing, the next degree, the next job, the next relationship, then you'll be satisfied. And then she'll come at you with her inevitable evils, sickness, death, broken relationships, these things that you have tasted already will remain. And in the end, you'll be reminded far too often that things are not the way they are supposed to be and that life feels like a long defeat. Perhaps at this point, you may be thinking, how can this possibly be a commencement address? <laughs> can we get someone to usher him off the stage so we can hear the inspiration that we came for? Where is the rah-rah you're going to change the world speech? I understand the sentiment. And no, the point here is not merely to say that we experience Tolkien's long defeat, but we cannot move past it quickly or glibly. We must give it its time. We must grieve it. But then we must ask, what prevents the long defeat from just being meaningless suffering? If all of life is just one big defeat, uh, why not say, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die? Or to put the question even more simply, why fight the long defeat at all? And I think there are at least two answers to that question that I'm going to try and give this evening. First, the suffering of the long defeat is for something worth defending. Hezekiah stood on the walls of Jerusalem facing fearful odds, but he had something to protect. A promised land, a covenant people, and the reputation of his God, who is our God. Alfred, too, had something worth fighting for. Christianity in England stood in the balance. Would the kingdom worship the pagan gods of the Danes or the one true king? And of course, like Hezekiah, Alfred's was a battle for his homeland, for his family, and for his children. One of the reasons providence exists is for this purpose, to defend something worth defending, that which is true, good, and beautiful, against all her enemies so that they may be preserved for generations to come. And that's what we've hopefully equipped you to do as you leave this place. You have defended your theses, grown in maturity, and learned to read and apply the scriptures. Your thinking has been sharpened, your virtue tested, and the roots of your faith planted deep. 
There is a battle for the cosmos, and you're enlisted as much as the men of he on Hezekiah's walls or in Alfred's ranks. To fight in the long defeat is to echo the words of Horatius as he stood on the bridge, preparing, prepared to die to protect his home. As the poem goes, then out spake brave Horatius, the captain of the gate, to every man upon this earth death cometh soon or late. And how can man die better than facing fearful, fearful odds for the ashes of his fathers and the temples of his gods? There is glory in suffering for history, for our tradition, for our faith, for our families. And so one reason that we bless you and send you off uh, to fight the long defeat is because it's a battle worth fighting for something worth saving. But there is a second and more profound and important reason to fight the long defeat. And that is because in the Christian story, and seniors, you need to appreciate the Chestertonian paradox here, the long defeat is actually the means of true and lasting victory. We can embrace the long defeat uh, because we know that it was by being defeated that Christ overcame sin, Satan, death, and every last thread of evil that weaves its way into our broken lives and broken world. Tolkien called this the eucatastrophe, the sudden, unexpected, favorable turn in events that takes what seems like certain defeat and replaces it with a happy ending. The gospel itself is the eucatastrophe of the story of the world. It is the good news of victory over guilt, sin, Satan, and death made possible by the apparent defeat of God on a piece of wood on a hill outside Jerusalem. And so when we fight the long defeat and so we when we fight the long defeat in an endeavor to protect that which is true, good, and beautiful, we are imaging our God and our Savior, Jesus, who said, whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. As you live a cruciform life, dying to yourselves for the sake of others, you imitate Hezekiah and Alfred and Jesus, who lived their lives as though they were meant to be spent for something of immeasurable value. Zegan Becca, I've seen you embody this very thing throughout your time at Providence, but most especially during your senior year. While other senior classes may be inclined to mail it in, disengage, throw in the towel, the two of you have sought to lead the upper school by word and example. You've sacrificed and given of yourselves to your peers and your teachers. You've modeled sacrificial leadership and defended that which is true and good and beautiful within these walls. I've seen you be honest about your weaknesses and glimpse the reality that the path to glory is not through image, power, or pleasure, but through service and suffering. Our lives, your lives, are not meant to be spent on the mere fleeting pleasure, on the fleeting pursuit of pleasure, the aura of success, or the illusion of control that power grants. They are meant to be spent for others, for your neighbors, for your friends, for your family, for your church, for your children, should the Lord grant it. But most of all, they are meant to be spent for the one who made you. And as you spend your life this way, as you lose it, you will find that you have found it a thousand times over again. Alfred heard the words of Guthrum, and he sang his own song back. For God hath blessed creation, calling it good. I know what spirit with whom you blindly band hath blessed destruction with his hand. And listen to this part. Yet by God's death, the stars shall stand and the small apples grow. Alfred knew the shape of the story. He knew that defeat and almost certain death were not the end. They were the very means by which the stars would stand and the small apples grow for eternity. And so he trusts the joy without a cause and the faith without a hope, and he marches into an unwinnable battle against Guthrum and his Viking army, and he finds an unexpected victory. Hezekiah heard the words of the Rabshakeh, taunting him with the broken idols of defeated gods. Hezekiah heard the question, who will you trust? 
And do you know what he did? He prayed. He went to the Lord and prayed. He prayed, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see, and hear all the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste to all the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they were destroyed. So now, O Lord, our God, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are our God. And the Lord, as is his habit, heard Hezekiah's prayer. He saw Hezekiah's trust, and he took certain defeat, and he turned it into an unexpected victory. This is where your true hope lies, class of 2022. Not in yourselves, your achievements, or your victories, but in the God who takes the long defeat and makes it an eternal victory through Christ Jesus, our Lord. May you trust in him, may you abide in him, and may you love him all the days of your life. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Keating. It is my honor now to present diplomas of graduation to the class of 2022. Please rise, class of 2022. I will call forward each of you by name, and you will be greeted by myself, our dean, Mr. Keating, and then you will be presented with your diploma from our president of the board, Mr. Dan Marcotte. Rebecca Jane Marcotte. Ezekiel Jotham Sparks. <laughs> Seniors, you may move your tassels. I now present to you the graduating class of 2022. We will now have the traditional presentation from the upper school choir joined by alumni as they sing, O Little Flock.
Thank you again, Upper School Choir and our alumni. Now, as you leave these walls, I give you these six charges. I charge you to be good servants, being increasingly conformed to the model of virtue we see in Christ Jesus, who came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Second, I charge you to be true scholars, cultivating the virtues of humility and charity in your pursuit of truth, aspiring to be charitable readers of others, well-rounded men and women, and insatiably curious lifelong learners. Third, I charge you to be beautiful witnesses to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with clear and convicted use of the language God has given us. By God's grace, I charge you to go out into the world as those who seek to peel back the darkness and bring the light of Christ. Fourth, I charge you to be a citizen of God's kingdom, first and foremost, prepared to confront the trials and challenges of life and serve as stewards of the good creation God has entrusted to you, his image bearers, in whatever vocation to which you may be called. Fifth, I charge you to use your gifts for the good of others, for your families, churches, communities, nation, and the world. And sixth, finally, I charge you to do these things for God's glory and not your own. Non nobis, domine, domine, sed tuo da gloria. In addition to these charges, I was also, as you may recall, the keynote speaker at your sixth grade graduation many years ago, <laughs> which also included some excerpts from G.K. Chesterton. And so I wanted to reiterate the two charges I gave then that still apply now. Persist in maintaining a fear of the Lord and a sense of wonder at his world and his word. As we grow, these can be easy to lose, but the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the sustainer of wonder. Never get too caught up in the busyness and the struggles of life that you would miss the precious gifts that God gives in all of the small everyday blessings that we often miss or forget. The faculty will now perform a final song and then after that song, Mr. Keating will close us in a word of prayer. Then there will be a recessional, after which all will be dismissed to the multi-purpose room for refreshments and fellowship. The, ga the graduates will gather outside in the front of the school building facing Lindbergh so that we can get pictures as a class and faculty in front of the school sign before we would join the rest of you in the multi-purpose room. So after our closing song and after Mr. Keating's final prayer, we will recess and then dismiss. So faculty, if you would please get in place.
invite you all to stand as I pray to close out our time this evening. Lord, we are grateful for tonight. We're grateful for the opportunity to celebrate this victory with our graduating class of 2022. We're grateful for the many victories that their time at Providence has seen. But most of all, Lord, we are grateful for the victory that's found in your son, Jesus Christ, who lived and died and rose again for each one of us. And so we pray tonight that you are exalted in our hearts and our minds. And we pray that as we leave this place, that that would carry on and that we would uh, find our hope and our joy in your victory above all else. And we pray that for our seniors, for Becca and Zeke as they go. We pray all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.